So we got the chance uh, in this interview to speak with Major General Ken Bowray, um, who's been a general officer in Special Forces for a great part of his life. Um, served as a lieutenant in uh, uh, SOG as a 1-0 on two recon teams. Um, and what an incredible opportunity to get to talk to him it was. Yeah, and, and I mean, I've worked with him now very, very closely on writing the campaign for, for three years um, altogether. And, you know, with, with all the mission design input we've had, having, having his general officer sort of eagle eye view every detail every aspect covered uh you know meticulous recollection uh fantastic i mean what a what a, an amazing resource for any video game uh, to have it's been it's been a, a brilliant collaboration and and i think it comes out in in the mission design he's clearly so passionate about what he's done and and what all of the the men in in recon have done over the years you know not just the americans but also the indigenous troops you can tell he speaks very positively about them and um is is very passionate about that and this interview gives such an awesome perspective um for anybody who's who's not just uh the people wanting to learn about sog itself but in our game you know people running as a one zero Watching this interview is going to give you a perspective on what went through a, a one zero team leader's head uh, during the planning and execution processes brings you straight from the beginning all the way through the, the end of a mission. And how cool is that to be able to, to get that perspective? Yeah. And right at the end, um, there's an Easter egg in the campaign. I'm not going to say what it is, but, but Ken very, very kindly uh, worked with Tilt uh, and Jim and Don on that. Um, and there's a very special bit of, of Ken going into, into the finale. So uh, we'll let you find that out for yourselves. We're welcoming today uh, Major General Ken Bowray, and um, he's been helping us with the video game, um, Sog Prairie Fire. Uh, for probably more than two years now, I think. Yeah, actually, I think we initiated contact um, February three years ago, really, when I was uh, on travel in Hawaii. That's right. And you very graciously called back this unknown Brit who'd left you a garbled voice message about a video game about SOG. Right. Uh, but uh, no, it's been terrific, you know, the time together to work together uh, to give the right tribute, you know, to those who served our U.S. and our indigenous troops and their legacy to make that uh, continue to others. Basically, um, without your help, Ken, I think we wouldn't have been anywhere near so motivated. So I'll start off with a big thank you uh, from me and from the whole team uh, for supporting us throughout our trials and, and tribulations building this game. Well, oh, pleasure. My pleasure. Thank you. Okay, and for those that that, have, um, that, that are watching this for the first time, um, Ken retired as a, a major general, as a two star, um, and was the commanding general, U.S. Special Forces Airborne Southern Command. Well, actually, Special Forces Command at Fort Bragg, and then uh, when you mentioned Southern Command, that was his commanding general of Special Operations Command, U.S. Southern Command. That was a one-star position. So there's there's been different assignments throughout my service in Special Operations. Thank you. And uh, I'm always getting it wrong, so I apologize. Um, but yeah, you've, you've held a lot of titles in your career. And, and uh, um, along with uh, Eldon Bargewell, the, you know, the, another um, esteemed uh, two-star that came from SOG, um, are there any other general officers that came from SOG? Offhand, um, I don't recall at the time, but uh, as you mentioned, Eldon, there's no one any finer, no better one zero, or some equal but close, uh, wonderful friend. And actually, he and I served together uh, through the years. And it was fitting when I left NATO that Eldon was my replacement. So we had a chance to work together again. Uh, as we did our transition, and no greater friend in American. And is it, is it, did I hear right? There's going to be a statue for him? Yeah, there is, um, yes, uh, a movement out there to recognize him, I believe, in his hometown. 
And uh, I don't have all the specifics at this time, but it's, it would be a, a very fitting recognition to a great soldier. And, uh, and you, you, you met in Vietnam when you were over there. We did, over in Recon Company. Uh, I was on RT Idaho, and Eldon was uh, one zero uh, of another team there, and we became friends and worked together. He had a lot of experience, um, and I learned a lot from Eldon. And that was the kind of experience um, of SOG, wasn't it, that you would learn from each other, and uh, there was always notes being passed and, and advice being given. It, it really uh, was special in that respect. Um, the older one zeros or personnel, you know, in recon company would basically take you under wing uh, to help you to uh, emphasize certain things in mission prep, uh, in your training, and then also to go with you from time to time as a strap hanger to give you not only an extra gun, but that extra experience of, uh, of serving with you. And I recall one NCO, Pappy Wells, came up to me after we had drawn a pretty bad target. We were going through our mission prep. And he said, well, sir, I understand you drew a bad one. And uh, he said, uh, you know, there were two teams previously lost in that target area. And he said, you know, I'm not doing anything for the next few me weeks. Would you mind if I went with you? And, and that was special because he had so much experience. And in a nice way, he was saying, hey, look, I want to go out there and help you. So wonderful team. And the key word, I think, for recon company with the recon teams was teamwork. Could I ask you, um, just as a sort of introduction, because you, you serve some unusual tours in Southeast Asia, could you give us a sort of over, overview of what, what you did in Southeast Asia from beginning to end? Sure. I, I think, uh, of course, we are, we're aware of serving, me serving with uh, SOG as a 1-0 team leader. Um, and then later, uh, there was a program that was developed to assist the Cambodian government with the training of their forces. Uh, and that was called the FANC Training Program, or UITG. And basically, it was bringing Cambodian units in to various training centers to train at the battalion level with everything from battalion tactics all the way down to individual and leadership training and then take these Cambodian units out on operations uh, as you kind of a final graduation exercise for a, about a two week operation with smaller ones in between. So really my time there was uh, as with SOG and then with the Cambodian training program. And after returning to fifth group at Fort Bragg, I returned to my Cambodians and worked out of the American embassy in Phnom Penh for a year uh, and was able to get out with units to provide ground truth of what was going on and uh, was there through the final uh, evacuation of the embassy as the Khmer Rouge closed in on Phnom Penh for Operation Eagle Paul. Thank you. And, and I mean, that's, that's an amazing um, experience that I think a lot of Vietnam veterans would never have, uh, you know, stayed beyond 71, 72. Um, and for you, you stayed in theatre for right up to 75. It's, it's very unusual, I think. Is that, is that fair to say? It, there was, a, a, of course, a downsize in U.S. involvement. And uh, so to me, it was important to get back to be with the soldiers that I had trained, the Cambodian units. Uh, to do my best to help out with them. Um, but due to lack of continued funding, the end came for us and it came, of course, for Saigon, which fell after we did in Phnom Penh. But really it was all mathematical when you looked at the funds remaining, the, the ammunition stockage, how many artillery rounds remained. It really was a matter of time, but to me it was absolutely important to get back there to help out. So I guess um, some of your guys would have would have escaped or would have would have made it through the camps after the fall. Several of several of them did. Um, 
the the Khmer Rouge were absolutely ruthless. Um, they evacuated the entire city of Phnom Penh when they took over Phnom Penh. And of course, then we've all heard about the killing fields where everyone was moved to the countryside for an agricultural based, you know, nation, if you would. But the starvation, the repercussions, the murder of anyone who'd been associated with the Lan Nol regime, the Khmer Republic, from teachers to doctors to sick people were all eliminated. So very few made it out, but a couple of had, did, and I was able to sponsor them when they made it out to the refugee camps and bring them back to the States. One of my Cambodians was actually in the States at the time, and uh, actually two of them were. One's going through the SF qualification course and another was at a communications course. So their sponsorship was relatively easy as opposed to moving someone from refugee camp in Thailand. Mm -hmm. But again, very, very few made it out. Yeah. Yeah. So I guess a, quite a bitter end to the war for you. It, it was. Yeah. Um, there was one time, probably going to say about 15 years after, uh, one of the Americans who had served with me at the embassy had gone back to Cambodia and called me, found me after he got home and said, hey, I want to let you know I was in this one remote area and one Cambodian came up to him and uh, knew that he had been in the service because uh, I guess his guide told him that and had served in Cambodia. And he came up, he said, do you know Captain Beauray? And of course, the guy I'd served with, we were friends. And, and he said, of course. He said, well, you tell him, please, that I made it and survived. And that was a bright spot of sunshine when my friend gave me that call. So going back to the beginning of that, how, how did you come to volunteer into SOG? How did you know about it? Well, <clears throat> it wasn't widely advertised uh, at Fort Bragg at all. And it was really only through individuals who served there. Uh, I had one sergeant who had served at CCN. And uh, so I talked to him and, and he continued to tell me about it and why he thought it was an important assignment. Uh, I was immediately interested. Uh, we went back out to Camp McCall, our training site at SF, and there was uh, one captain out there who had also been out there at CCN. Um, we talked and I tried to learn as much as I could about it and get their recommendations. And then I applied for it and uh, within, three, four weeks, I was on orders. Okay, and so you were in country, and where did you get the orders? Uh, were you at Natrang or somewhere? No, well, no, I was still in, when I was back in the States, and I was selected for the, for the unit, and then uh, went ahead. Uh, there were a few interviews before that, and, uh, and then was assigned, and then reported to the headquarters in Natrang after landing in Vietnam and getting my way up to Natrang and in process there, and then waited for transportation once I had cleared all the in processing. And it was kind of interesting because one of the blocks I couldn't check off was the chaplain at Natrang, because uh, as I went, his assistant uh, in the office said, well, I can't check you in, sir, the chaplain's up at CCN. I said, oh, really? I can get with him up there. I said, what's he doing there? He said, oh, he's doing memorial services for the guys that were just killed. So it was kind of a indicator of this is going to be an interesting tour. That's a bit of a fair warning, isn't it, for what's to come? Um, so did you have any sense of what you were signing up for? I mean, you, you knew about the mission, but did you, did you have any sense of the, of the casualty rate? Probably not, you know. Um, <clears throat> You're young, you're invincible, and you're ready to save the world. And uh, but it was it was uh, something that I wouldn't hesitate to do ever again. Uh, and getting to the unit and getting with a team assigned to a team and getting out on the ground, um, it was special because it was special about those 
U.S. and indigenous team members, whether it was a, a Vietnamese team like I had with Idaho. In fact, Tilts and I, our same team at different times, uh, or a Montagnard team, as I later had Sidewinder, a Baru team. But it was all about, again, teamwork. I go back to that, uh, which made it special. But back to your question, did I really understand what was going to, how it was going to be? Not, not, not really. And, and I guess you found out reasonably quickly. I, when you arrived, you would have trained with the team before, um, before getting anywhere near into combat, I guess. Well, the, uh, there were several things. Uh, first of all, uh, came in, I was immediately assigned to Recon Company uh, and uh, then assigned as the 1-0 uh, team leader of the team, um, which is a vacant spot. And the 1-1 one, one assistant team leader was Frank Pulley, my, my special friend still, and, uh, and began training with the team. Um, However, there was a policy in SOG that Colonel Sadler, who was Chief SOG at the time, had that before you could assume one zero duties uh, and take a team out on the ground, you had to go through one zero school. And one zero school was a three week training program down at Long Time. And this was an incredible course that was composed of all instructors were former one zeros. And so not only the one zeros, but new personnel coming into the teams were going through this training period. You were broken down into teams. You had a former one zero who's your advisor and you went through every phase of training in a compacted period of time from communications to tactics, to weapons, uh, but then very unique training experiences that those one zeros had based on actual missions. Uh, you would then go out on the ground, actual live fire missions uh, as that training team. And then when you completed your training, uh, you'd return back to your unit. And of course we had individuals there from all three of the camps, North, Central and South. And, uh, and then you would return back and have a uh, go at going out on the ground as a one zero. You talked a little bit about that you served with RT Idaho and, and RT Sidewinder. I was wondering if you could give us maybe an idea of kind of some of the similarities or differences between these teams and, and what it was like serving with each of those. Sure. Idaho uh, was a Vietnamese team. And... Uh, an experienced team. Several of the team members had been there since Tilt Meyer was the team leader. Very experienced. Um, and again, a Vietnamese team. Um, in fact, one of Quang, one of our team members, was originally from North Vietnam. RT Sidewinder was a, a Baru Mountain Yard team. And my team there was from Quang Tri up north. Um, a northern mountain yard tribe. Um, throughout the camp, we had different ethnic groups uh, in specific teams, RTs. Example, we'd, we'd have a Rade mountain yard tribe, Sidai. We had Chinese, Nung, and Vietnamese. Um, but each team had that unique composition, but everyone got along extremely well. As far as experience, I would say all of the teams were good because the key point is that the indigenous team members uh, continued to stay on after the Americans would rotate back home after a year or an extended tour, uh, but they were there for the duration. Uh, they enjoyed the service there. It was a very good salary and benefits, and they were good at what they did, but they didn't have any rotation they didn't have a Dero state. For them, that war was you know, the duration. Um, consequently, they had tremendous experience. And I, I suppose that was kind of their home, so it, it probably kind of meant something completely, uh, maybe not completely different, but something that uh, was a little bit more personal for them. 
Yes, um, I agree. And they would get to go back to their villages periodically. And again, they were paid very well and they were able to improve the quality of life for their families. But to them, the war was a continuous ongoing, you know, way of life. Could you tell us a little bit about uh, SOG's mission uh, across the fence and in, uh, in Southeast Asia? Yeah. Let me try and do a historical snapshot. Uh, Rob, I think you'll understand fully. During the Second World War, um, Churchill gave a one-sentence mission statement to the British Special Operation Executive, the SOE. Uh, their mission for occupied Europe. It was very simple. It was set Europe ablaze. Tremendous mission order. Well, SOG had a similar mission. However, the focus was North Vietnam, the North Vietnamese forces. And so the missions were somewhat similar by setting the North Vietnamese units ablaze, having them being attacked on their home turf. Um, so if you look at that from the various components of SOG, whether it was us on the ground or the maritime units uh, or psychological type operations, um, it was a total warfare focused on the North Vietnamese. Could you tell us a little bit about your your team and kind of what traits were common among team members? And I guess, you know, you talked a little bit about some of the differences between the indigenous folks and in the uh, in each team but could you explain maybe some of the, the common traits that were found among SOG members and um and your teams and kind of how those played into the way that you approach missions and and uh and manage your teams yeah the uh first of all dedication was a common thread throughout all the teams to the mission and additionally it was, as I go back, teamwork. There were differences with their ethnic background, but that never really came into play. Everyone you know, stood together uh, as one. The common enemy was important. Um, to the mountain yards, the, the North Vietnamese were Vietnamese. They didn't really say, well, NVA or VC, um, it, they had been abused uh, over history uh, by the Vietnamese government at times from their perception and uh, in reality. And so they, there was a common hatred there, uh, I would say, among all the teams. The NVA were a formidable army force, a very professional, and uh, they were the common threat for all that we focused on. And so other points up across the teams, the skill sets were excellent. Yeah. Immediate action drills, tracking, um, tradecraft, all were good common traits across the teams. So how did, uh, how did you, when you first got to uh, your team, how was that, you know, you talked a little bit about the, the, the training process, you know, going through the, the course. How was it to join that team? Did you kind of rely on those team members and, you know, your, your as you said, your assistant one zero um, to integrate or, or, you know, how was that process kind of getting started with it? Well, for me, it was similar to assuming command of of any unit, whether it was a small unit or, or larger units. Um, it's the first thing I think that was important to me was to observe, to learn as much as I could, to respect the experience level of the team members, and to listen. Listening was important, to learn the SOPs, the uh, lessons learned that each individual had and that's critical rather than coming in saying you know we're going to do this right off the bat to disregard sops or lessons learned and so for me it was a learning experience of listening 
what was uh what was life like at uh, FOB one in SOG? Well, our camp, uh, which was later redesignated Task Force One Advisory Element, we were located at uh, Marble Mountain outside the base of Marble mm -hmm. Mountain and outside Da Nang, and uh, it was quite a complex, uh, secure facility. Everyone was badged and controlled access. We had the main camp areas with other with basic staff functions that you'd normally expect from your logistics to motor pool uh, to the tactical operations center where all mission planning was done and operations monitored. And then there were the rest of us down in recon company as we were called. And recon company was composed of the different reconnaissance teams. Uh, I think there were probably 15 at the time. And uh, that's where we had our our basic coaches. We had our own mess hall, and we had all of the uh, the indigenous mess hall area uh, and the indigenous areas. And then outside the wire, we had our immediate training uh, live fire range area. Um, but it was a self sufficient area with our helipads and uh, every facility that we really needed. That's really interesting to hear that that perspective on you know how things were were run with like you were saying security measures and whatnot. It's kind of a perspective you don't you don't hear as much. I was going to say on security, if I could add, um, we had problems at times. Um, we had infiltrators in the camp. Uh, we knew that you had to assume that despite all of the checks that were done, the credentials, the background of the Vietnamese, the local hires. Um, periodically, we, we found toe poppers uh, in the camp that were in the sand. We were, it was a sandy area because we were up there right on the water. And uh, additionally, an interesting story uh, is that uh, one night doing PT, we had someone out there with a suppressed rifle taking shots at us at night as we did our PT around the perimeter, who we never could locate that one time. And uh, so security really was an important issue. And additional thing, fast forward back after Vietnam, I was uh, at Fort Bragg going out on a halo jump just uh, one day and uh, a high altitude low opening. So we were all loaded up in the truck. And one of the sergeants who had been at CCN prior to me, uh, John Caviani, was in there. And John had been captured by the NVA when they overran Hickory. And uh, so I had a chance to talk to him about what happened after he was captured. And when he got finally up north to uh, Hanoi, he was being interrogated. And they asked him about his background. And he went to his cover story. He was a communicator and then just kind of gave the party line for his cover. Uh, the officer interrogated him, then had a handful of papers. And he said, no, Sergeant Caviani, you were assigned to Hickory. You, your background, special forces. Well, what they had was his official records. And what John said was that in the S1 shop where the local hires were, they had made copies of his record and we assume our others. Uh, and they had that up in Hanoi, which was a real eye opener. Clearly after the fact though. Rob, do um, you wanna to touch on missions? Yeah. Yeah, so um, one of the big features, I guess, of our work together over the last um, nearly three years um, has been the design of missions in, in the game. And uh, you've given us quite a few fantastic ideas, which we've had amazing fun realising and, and, then, and then actually playing, you know, as, as sort of recon. Um, so... Could you um, give us a, an overview of the sorts of missions you were doing when you were running Recon? Sure. Start with the basic mission, of course, reconnaissance uh, goes without saying. But as we looked at the special missions uh, that were unique, 
uh, that were given to us. They were, of course, ambushes, POW snatches, which is very high value, uh, wiretapping. Uh, psychological operations were also important, and, and that was done via items given to us through SOG headquarters. Example, on one mission, we were giving a, a bunch of letters in Vietnamese, as written by a North Vietnamese soldier, um, trying to, whoever found that would read those and just see how bad conditions were, complaining about arc lights and different things. And then it would be wrapped up in blue plastic, if I remember, because they would want to proof their letters and tie them down. And we dropped those down uh, off, the off our movement uh, area uh, when we exfilled, uh, just to play on their mind somewhat. And so those are some of the uh, standard uh, and, and a few of the special missions. Yeah, thank you. I mean, you, what, when we got into wiretaps, uh, when we were designing the mission, you were, you were explaining like in, in some incredible amount of detail, 50 years after the fact, uh, how to do a wiretap. So I assume you either have good notes or a phenomenal memory. I think it's a, a little bit of both as I kind of was trying to backtrack and, and put together. Um, yeah, the wiretap mission was very special because what that involved was tapping in with a special piece of equipment with a recorder built into it, uh, into the landlines that the North Vietnamese ran around their perimeters and their base camps or along their trails and, and routes. And so the goal, of course, was to get in undetected, uh, to be able to connect the device, to back off, to observe it, and then hopefully not be picked up by the North Vietnamese who ran security sweeps along their wires. Uh, a good practice uh, to make sure they weren't cut uh, or being tapped into. Um, a very important mission because the tr whatever occurred and we would have our translator or interpreter who would monitor them, uh, you know, who spoke Vietnamese, you know, if there was anything particular, you know, important coming up of time sensitivity. Yeah, and, uh, and you actually performed those yourself? You, you, you did wiretap missions with your team? I just did one. And, uh, and of course, we trained with it uh, also. Uh, trained it with the team, trained at 1-0 training, 1-0 school. Um, they were not a common mission, but it was an important mission. And I think Tilt has uh, an example or examples of some very successful ones. And, and um, the Eldest Son program, um, did you carry out any missions within that? Or it may have been given a different name by the time you were operating. No, it was, it was the same name. And yeah, we would drop off a, a parcel. And what that was, of course, is ammunition that had been doctored, which was 762 by 39 AK standard ammo, most likely in their tin, tin spam can type containers all sealed up and several of those rounds, whatever small percentage, when fired would cause the weapon to blow up and to kill or maim the shooter. Uh, and then again, this is a, a psychological operation, not so much to destroy an army, but to put doubt into their weapons, their ammunition, and to give them maybe a second thought about pulling the trigger. I think it was effective uh, in some ways. I've seen evidence, I think, in, in, in some SOG memoirs, uh, maybe in John Plaster's book, um, of, of uh, examples of men being found with a, you know, the receiver of their AK or the bolt you know, uh, stuck through their eye after a battle and uh, other guys with mortars where, where the, the whole mortar team's just wiped out next to a, an exploded mortar. Well, the, the interesting point also is every time we drew AKs uh, or RPGs for our missions that we didn't keep permanently or we drew ammo to go to the range to fire the, the NVA weapons, uh, always had that lingering thought 
I hope we have the right case of ammo and that they get this screwed up in the uh, supply area. Oh, that's, that, can't, that can't be a nice feeling. <laughs> Not at all. Oh, to know what you've, uh, what you've got. So um, yeah, I think you, you mentioned uh, HQ raids as well at one point. Um, did, did any of those happen while, during your tour with any other teams doing those? Not normally common. It was just luck of the draw. Um, you know, when you would get your call down for your mission, you'd go up to the, uh, the talk and you'd get with the area specialist team, the AST, and they would show you what good deal they had for you. Um, and, you know, to see what it was. So, I mean, I only drew one, thank goodness. And, uh, but the missions varied, uh, as we talked about the various type of missions, it depended what the priorities were. Uh, example, at one point, all the only missions we were drawing was to go out and to set up ambushes and to engage and inflict as many casualties as we could for a certain period of time and to withdraw. So it ran the whole spectrum of, you know, headquarters raids to getting as many kills as you could. Um, that was just the, the priority of missions that came down. On that, I mean, as you were one zero and, and, and an officer, um, how, how did you go about planning for your mission um, in terms of, you know, you, you've turned up at the talk, they've given you the, the target, and, and what happens after that? Right. Okay. Well, first of all, when I draw the mission, uh, I, they would have the area specialist sergeant would have a map. He'd have all the information on it, on that target and the area of operations, uh, the history, if any other teams had been into that area of operations. Um, review that. I would then take a lot of time and analyze them, do a map study. Uh, I would look at the terrain, the elevation, the differences in elevations um, for a route, for possible landing zones, specified tasks, implied tasks that went with that mission. Then I'd go down, uh, we'd get, get the team, I'd get the one, one would normally be with me up there. Um, we brief the team, not on the specific location, but what the mission was. And then we'd begin our team preparation. Um, that would be identifying all the special equipment that we'd need. Um, and then we'd work our rehearsals, rehearsals of live fire, immediate action drills. And that, that would continue during the planning cycle. For me as a team leader, the next step would do would be to schedule a visual reconnaissance after I'd done my map study of the area. And the VR was critical. Um, we'd go up to uh, the airfield at Da Nang. I'd link up with an Air Force pilot uh, who had an O2 observation aircraft. And uh, we'd go over the mission together. And then we'd fly out to the area. And you'd have to be careful. We'd have to fly adjacent to our box, whether it was a five by five kilometer or six by six kilometer box that we had been given. But the goal was to look at the terrain, to photograph the area of operations, again, from flying adjacent, not over directly over it, to look for possible landing zones, rally points, uh, and of course, learn as much as we could about the target. Um, we then come back, I take the photos, which I took with my Olympus Pen E 35 millimeter half frame camera, which was issue and a commercial camera. Uh, I'd then go up to the talk and I'd go to the photo lab. And one of the NCOs up there uh, would help me and we would develop the film and then we would enlarge it. And we'd get the photos uh, then I'd do a comparison with the map, ensuring that we could really designate our primary or alternate landing zones, look at route of march, um, and learn as much as we could of the area from those in large photographs. Again, this isn't uh, anything that is uh, space age like we have now with aerial photography and satellites for mission prep. But... Uh, we then would go back down to the team 
and review the AO with the team. Then we would then focus our rehearsal mission on distance and time that it would take for us to move. And the best way to do that was that we went to our live fire training area outside Da Nang, Monkey Mountain area, as, as it was called. And this was a, uh, a hilly, rocky, heavy, heavy uh, jungle, and then to lighter jungle. But what we could do is we could set up a very similar mission profile to infiltrate, move distances, actions on the objective, and exfil. And we would do that for several days. And at that point in time, we would go back and do our final mission prep, our final weapons tests, equipment check, and then we'd be ready uh, to be on call to launch and to move to a launch site uh, to execute the mission. Thank you, Ken. I, I'm just astounded at the, the quality answer you just gave. You, you answered every single point of everything we could possibly have wanted to know. Um, it, it, as, as only an officer, I think, really could, or, you know, um, a senior staff sergeant. So, well, I as a one zero, a good one zero. Yeah, I yeah, yeah, yeah. And uh, and I think that would be quite useful for our, for our players because they're that when they're designing missions themselves as well and thinking about how you know how to drill their teams and get them into the game. Um, it, it might be that they'll they'll watch this again and and you know and reflect on your experiences and how they can they can help them. Um, so just diving into a mission, uh, you know, if you could, could you pick a mission and, and, and sort of run us through uh, the beats of it? Um, and anything you like. Right. Um, once we had done our mission prep and, and we were, I would then as a team leader, give a brief back to the camp commander, and get final blessing, approval for, to execute the mission. Uh, we'd then be moved uh to the launch site. Uh, in my case, most, most of the time it was up in Fubai. And uh, so we would go to the airfield, we would go ahead and get on a, one of our own controlled C-130s or 123s, um, and we would fly up to Fubai, uh, where we had the launch site located, and of course, Tilt lived up there uh, for quite a long time. But it was again a controlled, classified area, and then we would go into the air, the uh, FOB, and we'd have an isolation area. Um, we would then, uh, and the isol purpose of the isolation area was that we didn't go out and talk the mission, or everyone wasn't aware of it, and by I mean everyone, the local hires. Um, so we had our own designated isolation facility. Then the big thing comes about the weather. Weather, as always and as it is right now, uh, really controlled when and if your infiltration could take place. So one of the unsung heroes really were the uh, Air Force weathermen at the FOB or back at uh, CCN. And I remember getting uh, a weather update before we went off to the launch site, one final approval. And his note to me said, uh, weather will be nice winds will not be strong enough to deflect your small arms fire. And I thought, well, there's a professional report. And uh, so weather was good, but back to the launch site, uh, you are ready to launch, the weather's good, you have the assets. And of course, what we would do is meet with pilots ahead of time. We'd go over the mission profile, our infill, uh, exfill, primary landing zones, alternate, and, and also false landing zones. And sometimes if, you know, we were very concerned always about the enemy having LZ watchers. And these were North Vietnamese or local air personnel in the area who could be woodcutters who lived out there, but basically they're on the payroll. Uh, more often though, North Vietnamese individual units, and they would watch every possible landing zone that you could go into. Um, and, and if they were on site, we would get on the ground and what they would do would communicate with the North Vietnamese unit nearby um, that we had infiltrated and they would start moving troops to the area. 
Now, sometimes you could hear it if they were very simple communications like signal shots, then you knew you were in trouble. But if you didn't hear the signal shots and if they had done it through other means, you wouldn't know till the NVA came. So one tactic that we did use periodically was false LZs, false insertions. We would go to a landing zone, we would set down, and then everyone would be laying low on the on the floor and the aircraft would take off. Another second bird would come in with the rest of the team and do the same thing. Then we'd move to another area and we'd hopscotch to that area further distance away, do the same things, and then kind of like a shell game. Then finally, we'd get to our actual LC and we would exfil. So we hoped that we could um, somewhat uh, trick the NVA or the LC watchers by doing that. Once you get uh, on the ground, um, move from the LZ a short distance, set up a perimeter, and stop and listen. And that was important. Wait until the assets, the birds left the area, till everything was normal, and then listen to see if there was any movement in our area. And from there, you would move and you'd conduct your mission. Your, your march was very slow, your movement off of trails, and again, with listening stops and halts, following the pre-planned route that we had done and identified from the visual reconnaissance and the rehearsal mission. Um, and any specific missions come to mind that you, you thought um, were, were a great mission and, and that you, it, I, I don't know if enjoyed is the right word, uh, but I guess it succeeded and, and came back and everything was great. Well, a great mission was getting in undetected and executing whatever it was we had to do and getting back undetected uh, in getting exfilled. Um, and that was a great mission. It's, uh, but I think more so than not, with that exception, I think Tilt would, would also say the same thing. Um, you know, look out for Murphy because if something could go wrong, um, you know, it often could. You know, example would be moving off of an LZ. And I recall thinking we had made it in undetected and we were now moving, execute the mission and everything was going as planned. Well, you know, most plans uh, never are successful uh, beyond, you know, your initial first step and then uh, things can go to hell sometimes. And while I was there confident we had made it and we were just resting, we were in tall elephant grass. You couldn't see a foot in front of you or to the side. That's when Kwong on my team, who Tilt can tell you all about too, uh, who's from North Vietnam, uh, gave the arm and hand signal that we had someone tailing us. There was someone on, on our tail. I hadn't heard a thing. Um, I was still, I mean, I believed him, but I still hadn't heard a thing. Uh, at that point, off to my side, I heard someone cough and it wasn't a team member. <laughs> it was in probably 10 feet, 20 feet from us. Uh, someone coughed. At that point in time, I knew not only did we have someone trailing us that the tail gunner picked up on, but we had someone at least on my flank and no telling where. Um, so that's kind of a mission going bad. And what that resulted in, of course, was a uh, immediate engagement and movement and to break contact. We had been discovered and to find an LZ that we had planned, again, in a mountainous ridgeline type area to exfil. Um, so that's probably a good example of things not going as planned. And, and once contact um, did initiate, what were your immediate action drills? What happened? The first thing we did 
to initiate contact. They had not engaged us at this time. I think they were closing in more of their team. And this turned out to be a counter reconnaissance team. The NVA had counter recon teams. They had evolved their tactics as we evolved our tactics, and they figured out how to best deal with recon teams. And one was to put together a counter reconnaissance team of good soldiers, and they were heavily armed and carried basic loads that were similar to ours. And that means a lot of ammunition, more than the normal four magazines an NVA soldier would carry. So in this, in this time, I knew we had a counter recon team on us. Uh, these weren't woodcutters. And um, so our first thought was, let's go ahead. They couldn't see us. They knew we were in there. We couldn't see them. So at that point, I gave the arm and hand signal for everyone to get a grenade out. Um, we all stood by. And then on order, we tossed the grenades out from our perimeter in all directions and then opened up with a magazine. We did our immediate action drill. Now, the only area that we had not had contact was forward, so we continued to move forward. And then to set up another perimeter, uh, a defensive perimeter, as to see what would then happen. What happened was the counter recon team communicated with a larger NVA company size force. Actually, it turned out to be a reinforced company. Um, and we set up our defensive position on a ridge line where we could look down into the valley area and uh, then be able to take, you know, any, uh, you know, return fire from anyone who had tracked us into that defensive position. Uh, that's a time where you needed to exfiltrate the target area. You'd been not only identified, discovered, engaged, and now they were closing in with a larger unit. And this was a standard um, mission, I think, of what how things would evolve often when you were in a heavy area. And uh, at that point in time, you bring in your, you call for your assets, you call for your close air support. This was not a prairie fire where every aircraft within several hundred miles would come in, or if it was a prairie fire, then everything stopped and every aircraft in the area would be coming in to, to come into you. Um, this is another area where weather comes in too. Uh, in this example, the weather closed in on us, uh, very limited visibility, uh, but gunships, Cobras made it in who were coming out with the slicks who had come from a refuel point. And, um, you know, that was uh, kind of a, a long afternoon. Yeah, I can, I, I, well, I can't really imagine, um, but, but you know, being hounded by, by hundreds, many hundreds of, of enemy, um, how do you keep the team together in that sort of situation? Again, it was the quality of the indigenous team member and the US team member or team members. Um, everyone pulled together. Um, and stacked magazines up. We couldn't run anywhere at this point in time. Um, we didn't have an LZ really near that we, they could set up on, so it was going to have to be a ladder extraction with a 60-foot ladder or a stabo or combination. Um, but it was everyone's skill, uh, dedication, and teamwork that stuck together, and... Uh, we just engaged the enemy uh, as, as they attempted and successfully moved up towards our location up the ridge line. To, we were on the high ground from them, which was a benefit. Yeah. But again, it was uh, the quality of the individual soldier. How did you find the NVA as, as, a, as a foe? The NVA were very professional, um, very disciplined. Um, I greatly respected them, and uh, there, there was no shortage of NVA uh, to, to worry about. There was quite the opposite, but a very dedicated, professional uh, force. And they were hell-bent on overrunning you, I guess, um, as part of their tactics. Absolutely. And, and what you have to remember is, you know, this was not a frontline battle engagement that American conventional units were, would have been in. 
uh, we were in their backyard. Um, we were in their rear elements. And the havoc that we caused disrupting their communications, their resupply, <laughs> um, not to mention uh, impacting on their morale. I mean, here they are in the rear area thinking they're very secure. And then a recon team engages them and impacts, you know, large amount of casualties on them. Uh, we were a real thorn in their side, the recon teams. And I think John Plaster and Tilt have excellent examples from their missions of tying up these enemy troops and forcing them to divert units and resources to deal with the recon teams from SOG. And um, can you tell us a little bit about being, because your missions would have lasted for typically a five-day recon? Yeah, um, it, normally a five-day, and that's what we went in for. Um, honestly, um, after day two, with my experiences, um, you would have contact. And unless you were put in a dry hole, um, which happened occasionally uh, where you could stay. But I honestly, uh, for me, two days was the max, except with my Cambodians. And, and that would have been much, much longer operations, which were two weeks duration for each one of those. Okay. And, and what, what was it like um, being on the ground at night doing the remain overnight? It was, in one way, very quiet. Um, it was dark because we were in the vegetation. But you heard every, you heard every sound that, that's made in the jungle from animals moving, which got your attention because you didn't know if it, initially if it was an animal or if it was an NVA. Um, there was... There was no shortage of mosquitoes, and it was a long, long night because you just didn't know what was there. You had your security, you rotated who's on, who was awake, um, but you could hear everything, you could smell everything, and, and I was worried that likewise they could hear, smell, uh, and knew where we were because at first light was the most dangerous time. As it started to get light, if they were there, that's when they were going to hit us. They would wait for us to move from our area. They knew we had claymores. We put claymores. They knew our SOPs, I think. Um, but when we started to move was when we were absolutely most vulnerable. And if they were set up, they would initiate contact at that time uh, and have the greatest chance of success. Having to sit there in the dark all night, did you get any sleep? Yeah, uh, you were tired, uh, you were somewhat dehydrated, and you'd drift off to sleep, um, and you'd wake up and make sure whoever's alert, you know, would have that, and you'd have the radio right there. I always carried the radio as the team leader, had that, had that handset so the volume was turned down because you didn't want to have a squelch, you know, indicate to anyone out there where your position was. Uh, but again, um, there were long nights. You didn't have a really restful sleep, that's for sure. Thank you, Ken. I, I mean, we, we've put um, a two RON moments into the game to, to, to simulate the experience. And uh, there, there is one of the missions where you're sitting there and you will see an NVA patrol walk by and uh, you could almost touch them. And they're, and they're whispering to each other as they walk past. And uh, I hope that that really spooks some of our players because they, they, you know, if they if they decide to shoot at that point, they're going to have to fight in the dark. <laughs> and we've never tried it because that's not something I really think is a sensible idea. Right. But it'd be well, interesting to see if players who play the game actually decide to open up on the patrol. Fortunately, in that mission, uh, Elsa tells them. Just to play it cool. <laughs> well, I, I was glad you said that because there no if they hadn't detected you, there was no reason to initiate contact because and you can't move at night unless you have to 
to break contact, um, your biggest advantage is laying low and not, not engaging them if they did not see you. Because you don't know what else is out there beyond those guys walking by you. What happened to your, your team tactics during contact after that, that kind of moment where you're, you're past the, the period where you're um, trying to be in stealth? Once, once things started getting heated, how did your team tactics kind of change or how did they hold up during that time? All right. Let me, let me begin with contact with the enemy. Immediate action drill it was standard, as you're familiar with to break contact. That was max fire on the enemy as we leapfrog backwards, engaging with full auto on our car 15s, M79 firing, if that was fired as a backup or as a primary by one of the team members, throwing out a claymore that we already had pre-wrapped and in a bag tossed out and we could put that claymore out uh, with a timer or we could do it command detonated. And then toe poppers, if we move back further enough to think that we are being tracked. But the goal was break contact, move from the area. And, the, you know, the normal mission that we were given, uh, and it was, you know, standard, was break contact, continue mission. Um, and it sounds good. It's, it's great bumper sticker. Um, but continue mission after breaking contact all depended on the enemy, how good they were and following you, uh, or had they blocked out the area where they coming in for another. Um, once you break contact and you did not, you believed you did not have the enemy moving in, move as fast as you can out of the area. And then you go to plan B. Okay, but what's our route to our primary target? Uh, if it's just an area reconnaissance within the box we're given, uh, to continue to move, but all the time to anticipate that the NBA were out there. Um, and that wouldn't have been just the one element that you encountered. Um, you then go back into your SOPs for movement, uh, for reporting if, as we had to, you know, and uh, the fact whenever he was due back up to give him a, a call sign uh, if we had one at the at the end of the day or first thing in the morning, and that was that was about it. But when when Kimchi really starts to hit the fan, what did you guys do to to bring it back? Well, pretty much as I, as I outlined. I mean, uh, if we had any doubt, if I had any doubt, you'd call for exfil. Okay, but um, that would be questioned when you get back obviously by the hierarchy of the command, you know, did you exfil too early? Um, the goal was to continue the mission and then we would go back and then take it from the beginning uh, and continue the mission as best we could. Uh, just kind of moving on from, from the tactical part to closer to actual equipment, what kind of equipment did, did you yourself carry and, and did your team carry on missions? Well, first of all, all of us uh, were wearing our stable rigs and stable rigs. Of course, uh, we had our web pistol belt, you know, through that. And we carried our ammunition uh, in uh, one quart canteen pouches, a uh, minimum of four or five. And, and that would have been five 20 rounders and one thirty rounders sticking up. Uh, and again, if you had a standard of four, I'd have one canteen pouch of uh, grenades. I'd have one small, small mini CS on my Stabo rig harness. As a team leader, I carried the radio and uh, any other special equipment that we may uh, have. For example, um, our security codes, our CAC codes uh, for authentication whenever we go. Uh, to communicate secure, I'd have to carry that. Other team members, we had the variety of weapons. I carried a CAR-15. My backup was a cut down M79 pistol. And that's why I had one pouch full of HE rounds. Um, other team members would have their primary CAR-15s. One of my indig had an RPG-2. And uh, 
then one of my indige and one an American, one one Frank Pulley had a uh, 203 grenade launcher on, under his car 15. And uh, everyone, of course, had Claymores. Everyone had smoke and uh, standard, again, IV bags. Everyone carried, everyone had their morphine, their medical kit, water, indigenous rations or what we carried, one already prepared and had it tape sealed and carried in my cargo pocket. As a team leader, at times I had my one zero vest, which was good because if I ever had to drop my ruck um, in my vest, I had everything that I really needed from keeping my map in there uh, to other equipment. Um, team leader, obviously I had the map also, which everybody was familiar with. Uh, special equipment was for whatever that mission was. If it was a wiretap mission, then of course you had the wiretap kit. And uh, other in, others had for POW snatch, we had the flex cuffs, the plastic cuffs for tying prisoners down. We had CS spray and the uh, we actually used our insect repellent container, small you know, plastic container filled with CS dust. So we could uh, spray that on our trail as we event, you know, moved out of an area. If we had trackers on us and the CS was to make the dogs, which they used uh, ineffective uh, with the CS. Special equipment also for the mission, uh, a silencer or a suppressor for weapon uh, as needed. Uh, but again, it was it was all mission dependent, and then the equipment common to all. I've, I've kind of highlighted that. Can you tell us a little bit about uh, the RPD? Yeah, uh, RPD was for one mission that I carried, and I thank thank Eldon Bargewell because I got it from Eldon. Um, cut off RPD that had the bipod cut off. The barrel was cut off up front. I carried the 100 round drums in a uh, US two quart canteen cover, which is a, a bigger bladder type canteen carrier and would have four drums on my belt. I'd take off, took off my car 15 magazines and I'd have 100 round drums, spare drum in my rucksack and then spread out to other team members. And uh, it put out a very heavy volume of fire uh, Again, contacts were very, very close. So this was exceptional. It was, I think, more streamlined than an M60. And uh, it was an excellent weapon. Can I just jump in on that, Ken? You, you saw Sam using the RPD in our mission the other, the other morning and uh, commented. So um, how, how was the way he was using it? How does that differ from how you would use it? I think he had a lot more ammunition than I did. <laughs> Um, uh, his, his, uh, bursts of fire were really longer. Um, like with an M60, you know, initially I would, you know, again, short burst, six, eight round burst, but once you were close and hooking and jabbing, um, yeah, you can put those long bursts out there, but I thought it was very realistic. Um, and I, during his movement, I thought it was excellent that he checked his wrist compass for his direction, which I think was Northwest. I can't recall. But uh, you had to do a lot of things, uh, keep tabs of all the team members, what you was doing. And a lot of members were, as you pointed out, too, crossing in front. And I understand that was the game, but fire was controlled. Uh, but I thought it was very good. I think the attention to detail to the weapon was absolutely superb.
That's so interesting to, to hear your perspective on that. Thank you. You also described um, that you carried the PRC 25 as a team leader. I've, I've heard that from a couple of other of the vets that uh, that they had the same thing. Did your 1-1 also carry a radio or did they have a different role than a radio operator? No, I, I was the radio operator, the 1-0. And uh, now everybody had their ERC-10 survival radios or 68, whatever version, you know, was the the fruit of the day there but everyone had their survival radio uh, only which they didn't use unless it was again for ena uh and to uh, to get help but also you know as we moved i think to the 77 um when we had the uh the ky38 secure device um that was a heavy load but you know again that was part of the job to carry this team later i needed to have instant communications with air support uh, it was helping us whether it was exfil aircraft or whether it would be fire support you know fire from gunships or other assets what you know i've heard a lot about different deception techniques and whatnot that uh, that uh, spike teams have used did you use any special camouflage or or, dete- or deception techniques such as like enemy uniforms and things like that um Yes, uh, there are not a lot of deception techniques, if you would. Um, some teams uh, went heavy on NVA uniforms, gear. Um, at, at some times, I, I, re- I really liked one set of North Vietnam uniform, a uh, set of NVA uniforms that uh, I always would carry as a spare, which was one of their uh, green uh, color uniforms because it was lightweight and it you know, you know, be wet all day and at night I could dry out real quick just wearing it along with a pith helmet. Um, but that was the exception rather than the rule. And uh, and all that that really did to you was gave you a small amount of time to put some doubt in that enemy point man who saw, who came up on you um, of, of doubt is, is this one, oh, this is one of our friendlies or not, just enough time for him not to engage and, and to question and, and not to uh, to drill everybody. Um, interesting, give you an example, not as a one zero, but as with my Cambodians, there it was a world of difference because when I went out, I, other than doing recon, with myself or one other person for the units to go out in the AOs. Um, it was a large company size force that we moved with that I would advise. And uh, it was not a standard conventional type unit company strength that you'd think of with everyone in the proper kit, everything in place, you know, that Sergeant Majors would make sure the canteen's on the right hip or something. That was kind of ragtag because all the equipment uh, was so varied and different from old French to Cambodian to U.S. Um, We were moving one day and it was towards the end of the day, so we had to get our position dug in and prepared, which was a big world of difference digging in. and so I was checking the perimeter after a while with the Cambodian commander, and uh, things were not looking good. It, it just wasn't going well. It was slow. Positions were not good. And guys were just cooking food, had campfires going, stuff I just caused, caused me to you know shudder after running recon. And uh, so I was pretty much chastising him saying, look at this, this isn't wrong, this is right. We're standing there. And then a a group of four soldiers walked in the camp, the perimeter in this, again, in the jungle. And these guys, I said, look at this, we've been here for 40 minutes and you got four more people dragging in. And I looked, we were so ragtag. These were four enemy that walked in our camp. They they thought we were, they, we were them because later on we overran a base camp no more than five kilometers from there. And uh, we were so bad, we didn't decept- do deception on purpose. That was just the way we were and totally, totally uh, deceived that en- those enemy that walked right into us. 
That's incredible. That's that's wow. I can't imagine what what happened to the those enemy. Did they just leave eventually or? Well, our guys didn't notice they were enemy. The enemy didn't notice that we were guys. I think I was the only guy and I was 20 feet away. And finally, the only thing I could do was to yell VC. Well, that's because everyone knew what a VC was. Mm -hmm. You know, I didn't want to say what type of enemy. Anyway, so I, I did that as I ran, for, you know, reached for my weapon and which I had put down at my feet there as we were kind of going through the map check and uh, the bad guys looked up, total panic. They turned around, literally ran into each other, bumping into each other, trying to turn around and get out. Our guys totally in shock and it basically became a wild west show. Um, you know, it was the gunfight at the OK Corral with everyone shooting in every direction. And uh, again, these guys were already inside the perimeter and uh, unbelievable statistics. They made it out before everyone could draw fire because the friendlies were on all sides of them. It was crazy. Um, totally ticked me off, you know, to have someone that close and get away. So the next early the next morning, tracked them down, um, kept going up in the hills further and ended up finding a battalion base camp there. So, um, you know, it's look out for Murphy, you know, and uh, expect the unexpected, but, you know, stuff happened. Did that Cambodian commander then learn his lesson? Did he change his tactics after that or change his management? He did. He did. He, uh, he worked hard, um, you know, and we worked hard to make him successful. And, um, you know, so again, this was not, you know, calling him on the carpet and taking him to the woodshed. This, this was, all right, let's learn from this thing. I said, okay. I said, actually, this has actually worked out for the best because we're going to track these guys down and we're going to have a great opportunity to uh, recon this site and then to take the mission from there. We found the enemy because of this, which was actually a blessing in disguise for us. Okay. So to, to bring back to your time in, in SOG, uh, what, and even in Cambodia as well, what types of weapons did you see the enemy using during that time? Weapons were, were very standard. Um, and by that, the rifle AK 47, either a wooden fixed stock or folding stock. All of them, most all were Chinese manufactured. Um, RPD, and then the uh, RPG-2. And uh, for sidearms, the TT-33 Tokarov for the officers or senior NCOs. Um, and so those were the norm. Uh, really didn't encounter any, any others. Rob, do you want to touch on air support now? Yeah, I do. Um, thank you, Ken. So um, could you tell us a little of your experiences um, around extracting and, uh, and using air support? Yeah, um, extraction, uh, key was communications, you know, with the aircraft and, uh, and fire support. And, uh, of course, key with communications also was the FAC, who was our lifeline you know, to get the assets moved because we couldn't communicate directly back to the FOB uh, or a refuel site where the aircraft would stand by the closest possible area. Um, so calling for exfil through the FAC um, and then, then getting contact with the aircraft. Uh, normally, the first contact I would have uh, would be with the Cobras who provided most of the support during my time, you know, again, in the area. The uh, direct combo with the, with the pilots was critical, whether it was uh, fast mover or Cobras uh, or other aircraft to be able to adjust that fire. Most importantly, to identify and confirm your location. So the communications was key uh, with the aircraft and 
identifying your position I mentioned is, is absolutely critical because you can't adjust fire unless they know where you are. Um, another key point of that is, as an example, during one mission, as the NVA were moving uh, towards us, uh, engaged uh, with an RPG-2, had one of my team members uh, stood up and blasted uh, them in the front. It's a great weapon, a great psychological weapon. Um, at that point, when he discharged and fired that round, I heard the two pilots, Cobra pilots, who were working in pair, saying, uh, just have a visual on RPG fire. Uh, let's go. We're rolling hot in hot and of course I was monitoring. I said, break, break, that's our weapon. Uh, we fire into a certain direction. Um, so identification of our location uh, was absolutely critical. Then continual commo uh, as they moved in for the exfil uh, and, uh, and then finally exfil. And, and I think when we very first um, started talking uh, all those years ago, um, I was asking you about um, Stavo ex extractions particularly, and I remember asking you the question, um, did you ever sleep on a string on the way out? Yeah, I did. Uh, also, the 60-foot uh, ladder was actually the best exfil over the strings because it was simpler to use. You jumped up to the ladder and snapped in your snap links on your stable harness. And all the exfil ships were during my time were rigged with a 60 foot extraction ladder. Hmm. Um, so, but did both. Uh, the ladder gave you a little more latitude. Once you're snapped in, you could rest your feet on it. Uh, and from both, you could also fire still down uh, onto the LC as you extracted. Yeah. And, and, and you managed to, um, you know, you were probably so exhausted, you managed to sleep on the ladder. Yeah, you would. You'd be wet, you'd be cold, and you, can, you can't imagine how, how cold you could be up there in the Asha um, during the rainy season, going up through clouds with AAA threat for the aircraft. Um, and we were extracted and... and went up to 9,000 or 10,000 feet. And uh, I just remember I've never been, that was the coldest I've ever been in my life, even including Arctic training later on. It was absolutely cold. I think I remember reading about people chipping ice off their faces and things. I, you know, I don't remember the, I remember getting hit in the face and I think and it was with ice and spit rain. It was cold. Must be quite a shock when you come out from the, the the heat and the humidity of the of the forest. Yeah, it uh, it really was significant, you know. And actually, f x filling on strings uh, or ladders uh, inherent risk to it. And the pilots were good because we did training before each mission with the assets, uh, as we call it, with the helos that would slicks bringing us in. We would practice with them string extraction, ladder extraction, and, and, and just during all our mission training rehearsals for the mission, uh, because what those pilots had to do was to be able, once you're hooked up on that 60 foot string or ladder, they had to realize that they had to pull up to, before they move forward so they didn't drag us through the trees. And that happened. You get guys drugging the trees, people injured, and you did, you know, and of course, you didn't want to bring the chopper down either. So uh, that was one thing I always sweated, and I know the pilots sweated it, and they were good, absolutely the finest pilots. I think it was Doug Godshaw that was telling me about um, when when you did a string extraction, you could you would be counterbalanced by the guy on the other side, and and he he had a very short mountain yard, and he was quite a big guy, and. So he finished up going like a pendulum, going going uh, further down than the and the yard was going further up, and and he finished up getting dragged across the ground. Yeah, it uh, it was dangerous. Um, it worked. Um, you had to make sure you weren't spinning, you know, and bumping into the your partner next to you, uh, and of course making sure everybody was snapped in fully. And, and sometimes you had to engage in contact when you were 
on the strings? During the exfil, it was it was not unusual. If you were in contact, you would still be emptying a magazine on the LZ at, at bad guys. Right. Um, could you tell us about your peace train experience? For one mission, as one zero, I went out to Da Nang Airfield. I linked up with the Air Force O2 pilot. We did. We were going through the target area. We kind of finished the area that we were doing, and so we were way far out. Um, this was a uh, southern Ashaw target. And uh, so as we're flying, uh, he asked if the pilot said, hey, would you want to uh, take the controls? And, you know, I started flying years before that in a canvas covered uh, J3 single engine aircraft and uh, with probably only six controls or pedals and a rudder. And then went on to some other aircraft, but I said, oh yeah, this is great. So here's this O2 and uh, I'm flying. And I said, yeah, this is great. And uh, but then we saw, we we're looking still cause we were still trying to identify targets. Uh, and uh, there was a bridge and uh, there, there was uh, a large group of NVA moving and up and across the bridge. And uh, so th now, now again, you know, this was something really new. Now we were so far back out. I mean, there was no one we could talk to, obviously, other than uh, Hillsboro 130 that was flying the AB Triple C up in theater. But uh, he said, "Hey, uh, you want to take it in for a rocket run?" And this was far from our target, and these were target of opportunity who deserved our Willie P rockets. So. I said, sure, this is great. Well, on our headset, because we've been up for quite a long time, we had Armed Forces Vietnam Radio Network, AFVN. And so as I proceeded in my unprofessional pilot's way to make a, to come in on that target and then to punch rockets on, on the radio, as I was diving in, I still remember it, was Cat Stevens, and Cat Stevens was singing Peace Train, which I thought was very appropriate as we came rolling in on this target. Uh, unfortunately, uh, I didn't quite roll in. I, I lined us up on a straight line to the target, uh, which meant they had a long time to shoot at us, which they did. The pilot took it and said, here, let me show you how to do this. And we went up altitude, then he dropped the wing and we came straight down in. Uh, and then, well, Cat Stevens is singing Peace Train. I was in charge of the rockets, firing the Willie Pete rockets. And uh, so every time I hear that song, I, I can't, uh, has, you know, I mean, help but to think about, you know, that day if Cat Stevens only knew he was with me then as I was putting rockets down on North Vietnamese troops. <laughs> it's, it's an amazing story <laughs> quite incredible what you get to do when you're in special forces yeah hollywood couldn't quite <laughs> reproduce that scene i don't think no um given all your experience um have you ever thought of writing a book not really uh not yet uh i i defer to those tremendous one zeros and who did so much john plaster and tilt and then others out there who've really done a great job um, but uh, i uh, you know i'm proud to have served with great soldiers and um, i'm just not i haven't really thought about doing a book okay well um i have to thank you for giving us um, several years insight into your experiences, which have enabled us to create the game uh, with you in it as a character. Um, we've, we're immensely grateful uh, to have had that experience with you and, and look forward to continuing that um, and with the SOA. And uh, I'd just like to ask one last question, which is what, what advice might you have to players when they're coming in to run recon for their first time? Well, I think, first of all, um, they've got to anticipate uh, any and all enemy actions uh, when they do their missions. Uh, expect the unexpected uh, and don't ever assume 
that the enemy won't do certain things. Um, communications between team members is absolutely critical. Their SOPs are absolutely critical. And uh, I think with that, uh, they, they'll learn through each mission. And that's important to learn through each mission uh, so that the next mission, they'll be more effective. That's brilliant. Well, Major General Bowre, thank you so much. Well, thank you, Rob. And again, uh, it's my pleasure. And then the importance of this, I think also is uh, to preserve the legacy of those who served, of our US team members and our indigenous team members, again, who I owe everything to, um, you know, my Vietnamese team, my Montagnard team, to, for all that they did, all that they sacrificed to sign up with us for the long duration. Um, they're just, uh, I owe them so much.